Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. As we continue in this time of safer at home living, I give thanks that we are able to worship together this morning. I am imagining many of your faces right now, and it's a joy to know that you're here. I know there are many with us this morning whom I haven't met, and I'm so grateful that you've decided to join us for worship this morning. As we move into this time of worship, I invite everyone to take a moment to say hello on our comment wall. Take a moment to share the peace of Christ with those in your homes and also those online together this morning. If during worship you find something particularly meaningful, please leave a comment and let us know that as well. I invite each of us as we move into this time of worship to take a few breaths to help to calm and center us, breathe into the knowledge of God's love and presence that is always with us, even during this time of physical distancing from one another. And now as the prelude begins, let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you. Sing praises to your name. As we gather in worship today, we take time to celebrate the life of our community. So I ask now that you open up your order of worship and turn to the insert as we celebrate our mission and common life together. Just a few things to lift up today. The first is that Messy Church um, is going online. So Messy Church is at home uh, for this month of May. And it's very timely because it is going to be filled with activities, story, and prayer that will help us as families to deal with fear, fear and anxiety and worry and all of those other feelings that may be coming up for youngsters during this time. So if you have a family, um, maybe you've experienced messy church before, um, or maybe you're just wondering what it's all about, uh, you can find more information and sign up for the messy church email by going to www.santamonicaumc.org slash messychurch. We also um, want to lift up uh, the ability of people to give um, and offer prayer requests during this time. Um, we're not together, and so our normal ways of, of running into one another and, and letting each other know about what is going on in our lives and the difficult things or the joys that, that we are facing just aren't going in the normal ways. So we do have an online uh, form to fill out. Um, you can find that um, on our website as well. And then lastly, we want to support uh, the work of um, our very close, uh, good, good friends over at Upward Bound House. Uh, they have, during this time, created a support fund uh, because of the um, extraordinary burden that this pandemic is placing on our homeless and at-risk families. And there are a lot of needs that are coming up right now. Um, some of them may be as simple as food. Some of them may be as complex as needing technology in order to um, take schooling into homes. Um, and Upward Bound House has created this support fund uh, for family emergencies. Um, so we do encourage you to learn more about that by visiting Upward Bound House's website, um, and you can also find how to donate uh, there as well. We thank God for these opportunities for fellowship, for worship, and for service. Thanks be to God. The psalm today is Psalm 66. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you. Sing praises to your name, Salah. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome 
in his deeds among mortals. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him, who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let the rebellious not exalt themselves. Selah. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our back. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a spacious space. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, those that my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fatlings. With the smoke of the sacrifice of rams, I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Salah. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried aloud to him, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The lesson today comes from the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 22 through 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the time of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
It's an incredibly strange experience to preach from a ca to a camera. <laughs> a clergy friend of mine joked on Facebook that COVID-19 has made us all televangelists. But you know, I don't think he's right. Televangelists have better hair. As for me, it's been four months nearly since I've had a haircut, and in my most vain moments, it's a little disquieting to know that this sermon will live forever on the internet, preserving this horribly messy do for the posterity of all future generations. I say this now because I know that on Monday, when I go to watch myself preach so that I can learn to do this part of my ministry better, I'm going to see my hair, I'm going to hear the sound of my own voice, and I'm going to cringe. There will be a tightness in my stomach and chest, a wince of pain on my face, and I'll be tempted to slam my laptop closed in order to avoid an encounter with my own awkwardness. Mm. This feeling has come to be called by the physical response that it produces. Cringe. It's also the subject of the book Cringeworthy, A Theory of Awkwardness by Melissa Dahl, in which she defines cringe as the intense visceral reaction produced by an awkward moment, an unpleasant kind of self-recognition where you suddenly see yourself through someone else's eyes. It's a forced moment of self-awareness, and it usually makes you cognizant of the disappointing fact that you aren't measuring up to your own self-concept. Mm. Even that definition is brutal. Cringe can be felt in the middle of embarrassment, and it can even be felt years or even decades later when our minds force us, without permission, mind you, to relive embarrassing moments from our pasts. My mom tells this story about when she was in junior high getting ready to go to a basketball game with her friend and her friend's older siblings, who she thought were just the coolest. She got ready, and as people in their early teens often do, she put on too much perfume. When her friend arrived, she got into the car, and in the enclosed space, the perfume was overpowering. And her friend's brother said something like, bit much perfume, huh? And in order to try to preserve her coolness, my mom lied about whether she was wearing perfume, which of course was patently obvious to everyone else in the car. She still, to this day, over 40 years later, has sudden moments of recollection that cause her to wince in pain. Mm. Cringe. There are many things that cause us to cringe. You might cringe in empathy with another person who's experiencing an embarrassing moment in much the same way that you might wince in pain if you see someone smash their hand with a hammer. We also might cringe at others who we think should be embarrassed, but who are actually displaying extreme self-confidence. The best example of that is the singer who tries out for the American Idol competition because they think that they have a voice worth sharing to the world and in reality, they can't hit a single note. We cringe at them because we're embarrassed for them. We cringe at them because we hope they will change. The psalm for this Sunday, which Michael Lamb read so well for us, is a psalm of praise to God because of God's goodness to God's people. It speaks of God's faithfulness to the generations by recalling God's saving deeds throughout history. This is a God worthy of praise, the psalmist is saying, because our God is a mighty deliverer. God has delivered us from slavery and exile and has given us a place of our own where we can be free. 
But this God is also a God of uncomfortable encounters. For you, O God, have tested us, the psalmist says. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our backs. You let peoples ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. And more than this, the psalmist expresses some trepidation about coming before God, saying, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. The psalmist knows what so many mystics and contemplatives have said throughout the centuries, and perhaps what we, too, have experienced. An encounter with the transcendent eternal humbles us. It immediately puts into perspective just how small and broken we are. To come before God is to risk a moment of self-illumination, to see ourselves in the light of the ways that even our self-conception doesn't measure up. It's the very definition of cringe. Melissa Dahl says that the moments that make us cringe are when we're yanked out of our own perspective and we can suddenly see ourselves from somebody else's point of view. I think that feeling is best encapsulated from the line early in the psalm that says, say to God, how awesome are your deeds? Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. Now, the, the Hebrew word here for cringe is an interesting one. It can mean to submit or to wince, but it can also mean to be caught in a lie. And I think that here we can start to understand how, how cringe can actually be part of God's plan for redemption. Cringe belies the prideful delusions that we hold about ourselves. The philosopher and video essayist Natalie Wynn puts it this way in her video about cringe. Cringe is the electric shock, the emotional punishment for being awkward. It enforces the limits of socially acceptable behavior by wounding the ego. What Natalie Wynn is saying is that cringe helps us to know how we ought to behave by humbling us. Humility. Don't you think that's something our world could use a little more of right now? The English actor George Arliss once remarked that humility is the only true wisdom by which we prepare our minds for all the possible changes of life. Isn't life throwing a lot of changes our way right now? When we look back at past pandemics, we see that many of them result in changes for the good of society. But we can also see that this kind of change isn't always guaranteed. In our text from the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul goes to Athens, the center of arts and philosophy for the ancient world. I imagine that he walked the steps to the Parthenon and marveled at the construction of its marble pillars. He might have thought about the great teachers of philosophy and ethics that had made the city the marvel of the world. Might he have thought about Socrates, the chief philosopher of Athens? During the life of Socrates, the city-state of Athens, in the middle of a war with neighboring Troy, experienced a terrible plague. It's estimated that up to 100,000 people in Athens were killed by the plague alone. The constant sight of death and decay caused the Athenians to enter into a time of great doubt about the gods. The plague spared not the pious, 
And so the worship of the gods began to wane, it is said. In response, the leaders of Athens, who were fearing the, that the plague was surely a punishment from the gods, passed strict laws of religious observance. They knew that, in their view, only by ensuring that the gods received the sacrifices could Athens win back their favor and ensure that another pandemic would never come to their land. Paul would have known that in the midst of all of this, Socrates began to teach publicly that the sacrifices to the gods really weren't important because the gods weren't vengeful. The gods weren't angry or hungry. Paul would have known that Socrates was then tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death for the charge of corrupting the minds of the youth with his impiety. Change was stifled, and an innocent man became the scapegoat, himself a sacrifice to appease the need for law and order, to appease the desire to go back to normal after the pandemic. As Paul traveled the city, he saw that the many Greek gods were still worshiped in Athens. The altars to them were strewn about the city, places to offer sacrifices to the hungry gods. Did Paul think of, of Socrates when he stood up and proclaimed that indeed, the God that created heaven and earth is not an angry God. The God in whom we live and move and have our being is not served by human hands. This God, the only God, is a God that gives. This unknown God is the God that you have been searching for, and this God gives new life now and forever through Jesus Christ. It's a moment of revelation, and according to the scriptures, the Spirit must have shown up because in that moment, some of them joined him and became believers because they had heard this good news, the God that gives amazing grace. It's a fundamental shift and a new way of thinking, a new way of relating to God. And I have to wonder, did these Athenians ever look back on their lives before they learned of Christ on this day? Did they ever, completely unprompted, think back to the times that they had offered sacrifices to objects made by hands, only to wince in pain at how wrong they were? You know, this is where I start to question the value of cringe. Because cringe just happens to look an awful lot like shame. Shame. I know that many of us feel the weight of shame. Our society <laughs> seems to encourage it. In order to extract every last dollar and bit of life from us, our world constantly tells us that we are not good enough. If only we were smarter, thinner, more productive, then we could be free of shame. Then we could move into the future. But shame can't lead us forward. Shame does not lead us into a harmonious life with others, with God, with creation, or even with self. Shame leads us headfirst into hiding. It leads us running into the garden, desperately trying to hide by, from God behind some plants. Yes, life is throwing many changes our way right now. And not just changes to our daily routines or livelihoods, but changes to the very way that we view the fabric of our common life. COVID-19 is making known to us 
many realities that have been covered up. It is for many a new experience, a paradigm shift that gives lie to the idea that our society is fair and just. For many, the inequities that exist in our country are finally coming to light in ways that can no longer be ignored. And we are all faced with a choice. Will we move into a harmonious future? Or will we find a scapegoat to appease our desire to go back to normal? Normal. African-American poet and activist Sonia Renee Taylor says this about normal. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was never normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. My friends, we are being invited into a new future of harmonious and abundant living. And we can get there together if we turn away from shame and turn toward God. We can get there together if we learn to cringe at the greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack that we find in ourselves. We can get there together if we learn to give how God gives. In speaking about the relationship between cringe and shame, Natalie Wynn points out that the solution she has found to overcoming shame isn't self-criticism, and it isn't even self-love, which can be fickle. For her, the solution is self-indifference. This self-indifference is a kind of radical humility, which is found not by thinking less of yourself, but by thinking of yourself less. It acknowledges what American author David Foster Wallace found to be true, that there's a lot of narcissism in self-hatred. Pride and shame both center the self, and so self-indifference, as strange as it sounds, can go a long way in helping us to move forward. But I think that we can do better than self-indifference. We have Christ to guide us. As Paul says in the letter to the Philippians, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be held onto, but emptied himself. He emptied himself. Self-emptying as a way of becoming one with the self-giving love of God that empties us of pride, shame, embarrassment, and disgust as it opens us up to new understandings, new perspectives, new life. Emptied of pride, emptied of shame, we are transformed, no longer held back, by a desire for normalcy, by a desire for comfort, but freed to be the hope that God desires us to be for the world. This is what love can do. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Glory be to God. Amen.
time of prayer, a time to rest in God's loving presence and listen for God's voice. Let us be in prayer. Holy God, you call us to follow in the way of your risen Son and to care for our neighbors. In his example, we see what it means to love one another as you love us. Holy God, the days are long right now. We bring to you the prayers that weigh on our hearts the weariness we carry within, and the worries of our community and world. As we shelter in our homes, open our eyes to see those around us who are suffering, hurting, or alone. Give strength to all who serve in the medical profession, in healthcare facilities and hospitals, in our service industries and grocery stores. Help us to support them. Hold our families with your loving arms as they make their way through this uncertain time. Help us to find ways to celebrate the milestones of birthdays, graduations, and school year endings. Today, we celebrate the birth of baby Catherine Sondecker born to parents George and Elizabeth. Holy God, when life has been turned upside down, remind us that we are not alone. This day, we pray for healing and strength for Emmy Lou Winkler and Dennis Payne. And we offer prayers of comfort for Amy Liggett in the death of her father. We lift up those prayers we cannot find the words to speak, and we give them a voice, the voice of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We come to worship today in the midst of uncertainty and chaos in our world. But our faith tells us a wonderful, hopeful, and inspiring story of a generous God who calls us to be generous partners in making a difference in the world. Your continued financial support of the church is an important way that we can continue doing this good work in the world. Continue sharing God's love, caring for our neighbors through our ongoing ministries. You can mail your gift to the church or drop it off to the church office any day of the week. You can also give online, 
and you'll find the link to our secure online giving page in the description of this video. We are grateful for each one of you, and we thank you for your generous support. Please join me in the unison prayer. Self-giving God, come now to your children and make yourself known to us once more. Overlook our past ignorance and open us to new understanding. Through this act of offering, help us to empty ourselves from ego and self-loathing 
that we may be one with Christ in service to the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. May the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our door. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>